Excellent. This afternoon, it gives me great honor to introduce our keynote speaker who has comes highly recommended. Uh, Janet Sawari is going to be joining us and talking to us about the value of AI. She's the founder and CEO of Terra Labs and the AI Review. And I'm sure all of that will make more sense to you after the keynote presentation, but you're here to listen to her, not to me. So without further ado, Janet, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Oh, God. <laughs> so I'm Janet, and I'm the founder of Tear Labs. And basically, I spend a lot of my time researching or experimenting with AI, which to a lot of people sounds very strange because we're in an emerging market and I should be solving important problems. So I think throughout my talk, I'll explain why I do what I do, the value of what I do, and I'll hopefully help you to also relook and rethink AI. So my talk today, it's going to be on unlocking the value of AI. And I hope you're going to enjoy it. I'd like to start off with this quote by Satya Nadella, that the success in the age of artificial intelligence is going to require two things, a collaborative effort between humans and machines. I think this is where pure ingenuity comes in. So, once more, maybe just a few more things that I can add about myself. I actually am Malawi and Zimbabwean. I'm mixed, one parent's Malawian, one parent's Zimbabwean. And we always had the opportunity of having two worlds collide at home. And at school, similarly, I got to study in Ukraine, got to do some work in Moscow, also be speaking in Moscow this year, got to work at Baidu, work on Apollo 2, which is the autonomous vehicle. I was the first foreign engineer that led that project. And so a lot of what I do has to do with combining two, you know, even the way I cook, it's fusion cooking, you know, you can grab one thing, grab the other, just put it together and there you go, Bob's your uncle. The Mona Lisa, my favorite painting. I love art so much I almost became an art broker. And then COVID broke my heart. But the Mona Lisa is one of the most valuable paintings in the world. And I think we all know who painted the Mona Lisa, yes? I see a couple of nods, and the, okay. And what is it that would differentiate Leonardo from every other painter? Have you ever thought about that? Why is the Mona Lisa so expensive or so valuable? What is it that differentiates it? Another question, have you ever thought about how much the Mona Lisa is? I mean, if we all scrapped some change together and we said, well, we're gonna buy this thing. How much do you think we would need? A million? A billion? A hundred billion? <laughs> or maybe a trillion? The answer, oh, is that a hand? No, okay. One billion. One billion? So the answer is it's actually not for sale, which means it's more than one billion or one trillion or whichever you know, letter of the alphabet you could attach to it. It's so valuable, and I find that to be so fascinating. Similarly, the world of AI has started to mimic the same type of value, where the more people come and build things and collaborate, and the more technology that's coming on board, we're starting to see the real value, but it's different to everyone, right? It could be the time, the product, it could even just be the media around you having an AI product, right? but I don't consider that valuable. So let's talk. The Mona Lisa, what I believe makes it valuable is the skill that Leonardo had at the time. Ladies and gentlemen, do take note, I do speak in parables and lots of metaphors, but I think you'll pick it up. You are engineers after all, right? The skill he had. So first question, what is the skill that you have, or what is the skill 
that AI engineers have and how do we measure it as valuable? Secondly, the time, the time, the time, the time. Who can guess how much time did it take for Leonardo to draw the beautiful Mona Lisa? 30 minutes? <laughs> really? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. A year? Years? A month? Four years? Sir, did you just Google that? <laughs> Close. A lot of historians have been going back and forth over how many years, but I think closest is about six or seven years. Not necessarily that he sat down and painted for six or seven years, but in between there were some gaps and he was working on multiple projects. So the average could go down to maybe five years that he actually spent just painting the Mona Lisa. How many people do you know today that spent five years doing the exact same thing? Do you say not too many? <laughs> Bingo. So think about that in terms of value. What does that look like today? How much time are the skilled developers that we consider valuable, are the people within your organization that we consider valuable spending on building valuable things or building AI? Think about that. And then finally, the materials. This is probably my favorite one, and I'll get to it. Back in the day, paint was expensive. Lots of unique oils put together. You know, a few dyes, sand, and all these unique elements that would come together to create different textures that would come out differently on a canvas and look beautiful to make the Mona Lisa. The materials. Today, the materials we speak of, your hardware, your processors, your storage, your cloud, your PC. How valuable are they? <laughs> I think we all know this is definitely not the Mona Lisa. This is a deep fake. Using AI, video synthesis, a little fusion, someone managed to come up with that image of what Mona Lisa would have looked like if she were real, if she were here. Well, she was real, but I think you catch my drift. It looks so real, right? And then you might not be able to see these three clearly, but someone also managed to give her funny facial expressions, tilting her head and smiling. And But the Mona Lisa is so valuable, we can't even call it a billion or trillion dollar product we could buy. But that looks real. So what is valuable? So would you buy this? You, you would buy the, the, well, <laughs> all my life, all my conferences, you're the first, sir. <laughs> but on a serious note, if I was to present an AI-generated replica of the Mona Lisa and put it next to the real one, it would look exactly the same. Well, close to the same to the human eye. Would you buy it? <laughs> okay. If it's cheaper. If it's cheaper. <laughs> Do you see what I'm doing? You're struggling to answer because you know something's not right here, something's not consistent. What is real and what is not? What is valuable and what is not? This exercise I've been conducting since I first stood here 
is a way to show you that AI is challenging what we consider or what we perceive as value and as valuable in all meaning and in all context, how we produce it and the output. I wouldn't buy it. AI innovation objectives. AI does three main things. It helps us save on time, helps us to be efficient, and helps us to bring the value or the price down, the cost. My trigger on value. Stay with me, right? So when you're building a piece of innovation for your business, what is the most important thing that matters to you? Is it time, is it the cost, or is it how efficiently you're going to execute? At this rate, I'm going to start picking people. <laughs> All? I mean, if you had to pick one, or put them in, the, in, in some sort of order, Efficiency, okay. Yes? Okay, so money. So the price, the cost is what you care about. Okay, interesting. So typically, when I'm working with clients, even though I'm a founder, but I actually started off as an AI executive consultant. And that fancy title means I would work with executives, C-suite executives, to give them non-technical language about AI. Let them know what the AI readiness for their business was. We had a lot of executives or CEOs or leaders in 2016, you know, just come out and say, we want to build an AI. Well, what do you want to build, sir? <laughs> you know, and then say, well, we have a big budget of I don't know, $8 million, and, but what do you want to build? <laughs> we just need AI, you know, the board is driving us crazy, we need an AI. And then some, interesting enough, were businesses that didn't need any sort of AI or even just any sophisticated tech to start with. And so we had to evaluate what is your data level readiness, do you have enough data, do you have clean data, you know, uh, what are the ethical considerations we need to consider for your type of business? How do you get customer information? Or how are you building certain IP within your business? That would help us also be able to inform if we can build something and if anything or something, what? Right? So the worst thing you can do is to go, we want to build an AI. Always start with, you want to solve a problem. And when you figure out what's the problem you want to solve, go ahead and figure out who else has solved the problem. Then innovate on top of that. That's always been my approach, even in the lab. That's how we, we build. So that's your product, your process, and that entire process is iterative, becomes your, your business model innovation process. And it's a continuous approach. There's no point A to point B or point one to point two. You just keep on going. Interesting enough, before I get into the responsible AI framework, this process of iterating continuously is very collaborative. Everyone has to have a seat at the table. When I was just a developer, we'll just talk amongst our software dev team and we still would build really cool stuff that mattered and that was great. But now, when you build an AI-driven product, you need to have everyone at the table. You need to have your PMs, you need to have your devs, you need to have your technical people, your non-technical people, people that care about ethics. You need to have everyone in the room. Why? Because 
That's one. Yes. That is a very good response. Yes, so you play by the rules of the day. I wouldn't frame it that way, but that is, that is a good one. Otherwise, we might? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love that. Yes. Hmm. So I think everyone's response, fantastic, on point. But the key main one is AI affects everyone. It's an invasive technology, whether people like it or not. If I decide I want to build a model, a machine learning model that's going to help predict when the next fire is, do you think that's going to have anything to do with your personal information? Oh, it's going to be trees and bushes and fires and we're just going to skip over your face when we see it. It's going to include human data. So one of the interesting things that I've personally um, realized is almost every use case we look at when it comes to AI, whether it's large language models or computer vision models, whatever model is going to have some sort of degree of invasion to human data. Are we on the same page? Think about it, really. And we will have a section for questions. So yes, the responsible AI framework. You want to make sure you have fair AI that you're building, that your models address everyone's needs, everyone's reservations. Depending on whatever you're building, you want to make sure your AI is reliable, it's safe, it's traceable. Where do you get the data? How do you get the data? If we wake up one day and say we want to trace the pipeline, can we? And if we do, will we be happy with what we find? Privacy and security. I think in the future, um, if I digress briefly, this is not going to be a concern because more and more people are going to have to let go of what we consider private data because there's going to be so many different applications where we're going to have to surrender. So privacy and security, you want to be able to make sure you can protect the data as well that you've been able to take and leverage and build models on. And inclusiveness or inclusivity, that's the collaborative nature of innovation I mentioned earlier. That now, more than ever, everyone needs to have a seat at the table. It needs to be inclusive because it will affect all of us, right? And then transparency. I think I briefly mentioned you need to be able to have a, a framework where you can be able to see where you got the data, how you got the data. Everything needs to be transparent. Otherwise, you will face litigation, you will face challenges. And then accountability. This is the one most people don't talk about, especially what we call FANG. Your Facebook, your Amazon, your Netflix, and your Google. FANG. Every single day, they're in and out of court because they're not accountable to how they use our data, whether it's you scrolling past an ad or taking two seconds and looking at an ad, and the next thing this ad is attacking you, this one product you looked at for five seconds on your Instagram is now attacking you on every platform. I had that last week. I'm glad I survived. <laughs> I was looking for washing detergent, and I lingered too long on an Omo ad. And next thing, it's everywhere. It's on my LinkedIn, my Facebook, everything. And it's terrible. You guys are lucky to have me here. <laughs> Albert Einstein, probably one of my favorite scientists. When I was in high school, 
I used to complain to my parents about Einstein because my professor, my physics professor specifically, used to make us make these charts and then would put all the equations and would put all these things. I thought, why can't I just Google it somewhere? We have calculators and so I've always had a personal nexus connected to Einstein. But the reason he's up there is because of something I came up with. I don't know if you can see that brief text at the bottom. But AI has the ability to unlock vast amounts of intellectual energy. From data, similar to how E is equals to MC squared. And how E is equals to MC squared reveals the immense energy, energy contained within matter. So what is the constant within E is equals to MC squared? Yes? Sorry? The speed of? The speed of light? Okay. You can tell this is a room full of engineers because everyone just woke up. <laughs> it's like, I'm gonna figure this one out. Anyone? Huh. Okay. We all know what the E means, right? I think let me start there. <laughs> So in the world of AI, keep the E as your energy, right? Take the M and turn it into time. Think about how if time is the only constant and ideas are changing and AI is evolving, where is the value? I see a lot of smiles and smirks. Not sure if that's a good thing. <laughs> if time is the constant and energy is energy, where is the value? And AI is changing. AI will always be changing. Technology will always be evolving. Innovation by nature will always be evolving. Intellectual energy, the intellectual energy I define here is the ability to constantly come up with ideas, the ability to constantly innovate. Are there any questions? All right. AI strategy. I think it's one of the most beautiful things you can do for your organization to have a strategy in place, especially when it comes down to AI. Because guess what? AI is expensive to build. It takes a lot of time to build. And take it from a dev like me, it's not the most efficient process when building. But it helps us do the exact opposite of that once it's there. <laughs> Interesting, right? So once we have a chat GPT, it can help us save money and save time and be efficient. Boom, you have like hundreds and hundreds of words and you didn't think of any of it, amazing. But to build a chat GPT, OpenAI had to put millions and millions of hours and dollars and dev time and it wasn't an efficient process. Does anyone know how many times OpenAI pivot to chat DPT from day one? Do you actually think they sat down six or eight years ago and said, we're gonna build ChatGPT and build ChatGPT? It doesn't work that way. Who can guess, just a random guess, just ball in the air or in the park? 40? 42. <laughs> it's not 42. They didn't pivot 42 times. They probably would have needed a trillion dollars or something. 
second contender? No? Seven. Seven? <laughs> okay, kind of close. The number I heard was actually eight. So eight times they pivot, meaning they were building something, then they realized, uh oh, it's not gonna work, then start building something else, and uh oh, it's not gonna work, then build something, and uh oh, until they got to the eighth one, then finally ran with ChatGPT. It's a lot of money. Imagine what the board's faces look like. Pissed. So a strategy is definitely gonna help you. So typically, when I get to this point of my presentation, I like to talk about a really nice Coke ad, which I think you should still go and take a look at in your spare time. Um, it should be Coca-Cola's latest AI-generated advert and has a lot of interesting papers behind it, interesting information, a lot of work's been put into it. But today, I'm gonna talk about the landscape of AI in an emerging market, specifically how you can optimize value in industrial engineering because, well. So the first thing, AI in industrial engineering. It's been there for a long time. This is probably one of the industries where AI has been here earlier, but no one made noise about it. It wasn't the sexiest product or tools that were being used. It's been there for a lot of things like predictive maintenance, how you're able to optimize efficiency for large scale industrialization. There are a lot. Is there anyone who works within a mine or a supply chain space? Yes? Am I? Oh, okay, great. So in 2019, my team and I worked on a project at a mine and you won't believe the work that we were asked to do by this mining company that had really sophisticated and cool software. They wanted us to figure out how can we automate the process of making sure people don't go down the mining shaft without their protective gear. <laughs> oh, the coke ad. <laughs> well, I should have run it up for you. But basically, what we did is we trained an AI model on the faces of everyone that worked at the mine, or at least most of them. And then we trained the model to be able to recognize them when they had their protective gear and when they didn't. It was a little bit more than just protective gear and, and not. And basically, we connected it to a door to automate the process of giving entry and denying entry to the mine and then down the shaft. That simple. But I promise you, when we went into the boardroom initially to pitch this idea, it sounded like rocket science and, oh no, it's gonna take eight years, it's gonna take us a lot of money, it's gonna... But we did it in less than 12 months, successfully, pre-COVID, the coincidence was also quite serendipitous. So think about that. Do you think today it would still take my team and I 12 months or even nine months to build the same type of model, the same type of software? I see a lot of heads shaking. Well, I mean two, but. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't take a lot of time, right? Why? because it's been done. And not just it's been done, it's been done many times by many people. So it's innovation you're building on top of, right? Efficiency, cost, speed. Are you with me? Thank you. Predictive maintenance. Hmm, I was actually going to ask someone to tell us what they're working on, what AI is within your organization, because that would help me also to get an understanding of where you're at and... Do we have a contender? Yes, please. Mm 
Okay, I think that's close enough definitely to what I'm going to show in the coming slides of what we're working on and what I also want you to start thinking about in terms of the future and the way to go. So definitely, maybe not predictive maintenance alone because that will sort of close your thinking, but predictive AI is probably the lowest hanging fruit you can think of when it comes to the industrial space. There's a lot of data that's harvested daily or that can be harvested daily and utilized to be able to understand what's going to happen in the near future, right? We have predictive AI, we have generative AI, but we also have reactive AI, right? And I think for the industrial space, focus on predictive for now. And then energy efficiency optimization. So when you have a sort of demand side management platform, don't know if anyone's familiar with those. No. Okay, so maybe let, let me make it easier. ESCOM, we all know ESCOM. <laughs> I think we all love ESCOM, right? <laughs> um, but basically, think of it this way. If ESCOM needed to understand how much electricity they had on the grid or how much supply they could provide to us ahead of time and calculate everything properly, they would be able to predict how much they need to procure ahead of time so there's never any lag and we never have to lose electricity. Does that make sense? demand side management. It's more analytical, but still using AI. So that's a process that probably back in the day, I don't know, I'm assuming some data scientists and engineers would sit and then watch the numbers or try and just predict generally around this time of the month, this is how much is consumed. So maybe we need to make this amount of electricity available. Right, okay. And then product line optimization. So the work that I do actually has a little bit to do with this, and I think I'll talk about it in the next slide. Um, so I want to keep that as your dessert. And then cost reduction and return on investment. So this is a really exciting one because typically within your company, you would have to have someone who looks at each and every piece of resource you're putting in, then calculate it, and then do all of that. Now you can actually build an AI model for your organization to do all of that, to tell you down to the T from the percentage of time that's being put in to building something or building a piece of innovation all the way down to the cost. You can automate that entire process now. So what does the future look like? I think the future looks exciting, but it also looks really scary, if you're lazy. If you're someone who likes to build, someone is, who's daring, definitely there's a lot that you can find that will interest you in the future of AI. The future is not Robocop. It's definitely not Robocop. <laughs> so this is what I do as well in my day to day and I'm going to use it as a case study to prompt questions for the Q&A and also prompt different ideas and use cases you may be thinking about that you're unsure of that I can help us to all think about and consider if possible or not. So computer vision for large scale workspaces is what I do. Basically, we had two 
really bad pivots last year. So not to brag to OpenAI, but we didn't get to, to eight or, or nine pivots, just two. And out of the second pivot is the product called XVision. And basically what it does is utilizes CCTV footage in any facility, mainly large working spaces or large scale environments into intelligent insights or into an intelligent insight dashboard. So you can be able to understand everything from what we call the happiness quotient. If we had X Vision in here, I'd be able to tell you precisely how many people are ready to fall asleep. It sounds like it's not an important item to want to track within a business, but it actually is. Don't you want to know how many people are happy within your organization? With X Vision, we, we also can be able to track who's walking to the bathroom back and forth how many times? <laughs> that now, now we know, now we know who's, who's doing what. <laughs> so it was real quiet that side earlier. <laughs> With X Vision, we can be able to know within a manufacturing facility if people are actually maintaining compliance or not. We can be able to know if your teams are safe or not, if you have teams that extend to doing the groundwork. With X Vision, we can be able to automate surveillance within your private facility and be able to let you know immediately if something is happening or not that requires your attention. Like security breaches, or some instances the most sad ones, like people jumping over the fence to go and sneak in a piece of food or go sleep on your facility. We had a client who found out there were 20 people who had been living on his facility for almost three years and had no idea. Yeah. Sorry? <laughs> you want me to come back again? <laughs> Great. Um, so those are the type of things that AI can do. No one's ever asked me what X Vision means, but I'll tell you guys a secret because I like you guys. <laughs> but we couldn't figure out a name for X Vision for almost six months when we were building. And so one of the developers, an intern, just saved the file as X. And then that was it. But then I like to call it an extension. It extends vision. And then more recently, I gave it an even longer name and called it X Vision Illuminate. This is what it looks like. It's basically a dashboard, your numbers. That's what you get for security insights, compliance insights, and operational insights. And we don't consider it a safety platform. We consider it a more productivity platform. So if you're to speak to any of my team members and you say, oh, can you show us that safety thing you have again? We'll say, no, we, we don't. It's for productivity. So here's something really interesting for the industrial space Xvision can do. Can be able to leverage drone footage and using our models and the different plugins we have, you can actually use XVision for predictive maintenance of large scale infrastructure and assets. So if you have a pipe that would burst at the top of, I don't know, your pipes, and it's too dangerous, it's too expensive, it's gonna to take too long for someone to come, plug in a drone, get it to go up and down, XVision will take a picture or video and be able to tell you if there's a crack, if, if there's rust, if whatever the issue is that's causing a leakage or whatever the, the visual issue is. So what's interesting is, as human beings, there's a lot of work that we do within workspaces generally across industry verticals that is manual and that's visual. How many times have you been at work 
and then you have to just use your eyes to do part of your work. You don't write down anything. You don't have to do anything just besides just walk. Yep, she's there. Okay. Yep, it is there. And like that is part of your work. Or it's like part of your job description, but it's also not. Have you ever had that? And you kind of think, why are we doing this? So things like that, that's what we should look towards as another low hanging fruit in terms of what we should be using AI to make our lives easier so we can focus on more interesting and more important roles and tasks within our organizations. And that is also how I see X Vision. I don't see it as it's going to replace our security guards. I see it as it's going to augment their role. Instead of them having to look at 100 screens, now they just have to look at one. Instead of having to have your supervisor walk up and down with a notepad, now he just needs to look at a tablet. Oh yes, so we do have a special gift for you sponsored by the Southern African Institute of Industrial Engineering. And it's this report that actually talks about some of the future items that you should expect in the AI space that also highlights some of the points I've made. And I hope you're going to definitely enjoy it. If there's anyone having challenges with scanning the QR code, it's, it says what? No. Oh. Is there anyone who's downloaded it? No. All right. I think after the conference or by tomorrow, we can ask someone to put it on the WOVA app. The WOVA app. All right, great. Got it. So yes, I'll make sure everyone can access it on the WOVA app. I think you'll find a lot of interesting insights that we've put together in the form of a report. I feel like it can also help you to be able to understand what's happening because a lot happens in the AI space really quickly and you can be able to, um, I guess, get some interesting ideas. So I think this is the time where I'm going to close off and request if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So Janet specifically said she'd love to engage with some questions. So, so I'm sure you have some burning questions. Esty, you can start. Yes. Yes. So anything the human eye can do computer vision or X vision can do. So, so probably with drones or something like that, yeah. we need to actually have a position able for X vision to actually do something. Yeah, to train it first and then be able to, yeah. So yeah, it can. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, you said that we will be departing with a lot of our private data in future circumstances as AI develops and stuff. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe give us examples of exactly what private data will become public data per se? So, um, I think one of the biggest ones, there are a lot, uh, maybe referencing parts of you know social media and how we're already putting out a lot of information out there. But the biggest one for me is health data. So we're going to definitely have open medical data systems in the future, whereby anyone can be able to collect your information. You can look it up. Um, it's, it's there, it's coming. I also did write a paper about open medical data with the UN, which was on the New York Times. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can also look that up. And some of the things we spoke about actually got the company that I wrote for acquired by NASDAQ. So it's a big deal because a lot of the big players in the health tech space, they see it as much more efficient to be able to have 
platforms or systems that have everyone's information at once. So if there's a pandemic to break out, it's much easier to get everyone's information and be able to prescribe, you know, a vaccine or something like that. It's just much more efficient, but it does breach, you know, our private information, especially about our health. Hi. Um, Hi. In Africa, do you think we are more users of AI than developers of AI? And um, in the next few years, do you think, how do you think you can intervene to make us more, um, should I say, developers of AI, per se? But first of all, do you think we are more on the user side than being the actual developers? Mm. I think we are not the developers, uh, unfortunately, because we don't have relevant infrastructure to support full-on development of AI, or what we can really say is globally competitive AI tools. We have a lot of young people that are talented, but they're also not skilled. They're also not educated or enabled to then build. And then those that are brave enough and smart enough to build something, they don't get funding. Or at least they don't get the right type of funding that can give them the same runway a Google, an open AI, or any other global startup would have had to actually build something competitive. So I think the initial one for me is infrastructure. But I think if one or two pieces were to come together, I feel and I believe Africa can actually be the, the leading emerge tech innovation hub, global innovation hub we can produce for the world. Yes. Hi there. <clears throat> Thank you for the lovely presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask your computer vision models. Yes. Are they still training once they've been implemented? In other words, are they still learning from the data? Yes. And if so, how do you deal with people intentionally training it with incorrect responses, for example? Mm. Like with ChatGBT, mm -hmm, people are mm -hmm. intentionally giving it wrong information to make its accuracy worse. Yes, I've, I've, heard, of, I've heard of that. Um, I've heard there's actually group chats now on, uh, what's that blue app, the underground? Tele Telegram, yes. I always considered Telegram to be like a, a rebel of the apps. Uh, but yes, I've heard this group chats of people intentionally trying to break uh, <laughs> ChatGPT. But one way to do that when you're a business and you're actually developing a piece of AI or software is to follow the responsible AI framework. Um, because if you don't, you can get sued for a lot of money. Then if you're an individual and you don't follow maybe that same responsible AI framework, maybe I'm too lazy, maybe I don't know about it and it's too difficult. I think there's a lot of things that can go wrong with your code, or at least your model. Its level of accuracy will not be something that is uh, reliable, and then what's the point if you have an unreliable piece of software or a model that's not reliable, it's not accurate, essentially. Yeah. But one thing that's happening more and more is we have what are called foundational models and multimodal models, and they almost train themselves to some degree and what's happening is as they're like training themselves, it's almost the same way your mind works. And then when you have gaps in your mind, what do you do when you're thinking about something and you can't close the gap? You do one of two things. You source information from someone else to close that information gap or you make it up. So AI does that as well, it closes that gap when it's a foundational model and it's sort of training itself by hallucinating or, well, we've seen ChatGPT hallucinate lots of times, or it will then um, uh, use synthetic data, which mimics real data, but it's not, but it's synthetic. I don't know if that makes sense. Okay. Okay, yes. thank you, thank you, interesting. Um, the question I'm gonna ask has been asked before. I just wanna hear your perspective. There's this thing that, um, when will human cognitive thinking and creativity disappear, whereby AI supersedes what we can achieve? So which gen is gonna be redundant in terms of creativity and cognitive thinking, where the system will just do the job for us? Mm. 
So that's a really good question because um, part of my goal with this particular presentation and presentation style is to get you to think about what the real value of anything is, right? The value of your cognitive superpowers and the value of AI's creative superpowers. To answer your question, I think creativity in human beings will always be there. I think it would definitely be challenged by AI. And then cognitive thinking or cognitive, cognitive muscles, I think we're going to always need them nevertheless, right? But I think AI will weaken that. So the creative side, I think it will strengthen and then it will weaken our cognitive abilities because I think we're going to get lazy to think Similarly with ChatGPT, I've seen emails now that almost sound like they're coming from the same place and they all, it, it's, people are getting lazier, you know, and we're not even at the, the supreme AI yet, you know. I think what you're referencing is a singular AI or super intelligent where it has a sense of singularness so it can think on its own and make decisions on its own and almost feel and have empathy and do dangerous things and say, I like you and I don't like you and, you know, so, yeah, so I think that's my take on that. Thank you, Janet. So thank on you. that very provocative note, I'm gonna <laughs> say thank you to Janet um, for spending time with us today. Thank you Thank very you. Much. Thank you, guys.